Hello, I'm Jane Fuller, Senior Fellow at the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. And I'm very much looking forward to this video in which Una MacDonald will um, discuss her book, Cryptocurrencies, Money, Trust and Regulation, um, with me and more importantly, uh, Dave Birch. So I'll just quickly um, tell you a little bit about Una and Dave, um, and then Una will tell us, um, will run us through the themes of the book before we debate it. So Una MacDonald, CBE, uh, is an international expert in financial regulation. She served on the board of the Financial Services Authority and the Investors' Compensation Scheme, and also been involved in the boards setting insurance and actuarial standards, and on company boards. And she is, of course, also formally uh, a member of Parliament. Um, she's written a number of previous books, um, including Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which had the wonderful subtitle, Turning the American Dream into a Nightmare. And I think this may be some eff echoes of this in her approach to cryptocurrencies, because uh, obviously a lot of people um, regard crypto as a, some sort of dreamlike um, wonder invention. Um, and Una, as one might expect, is a bit more sceptical. Anyway, to uh, debate the themes of her book and it more generally issues to do with cryptocurrencies, we have Dave Birch, who's another old friend of the CSFI. He's a director of Consult Hyperion, a visiting lecturer at the University of Surrey, and an internationally recognised thought leader in digital identity and digital money. So first of all, um, Una, perhaps you'd just like to set out the main themes of your book. Right. Uh, first of all, on is it really money? So I decided to start at the beginning, which is why did Bitcoin come about? Whose idea was it? How did he view Bitcoin? And I think for him, uh, part of a strand in American approach to central banking, scepticism about the role of a central bank and looking for alternatives to a central bank, particularly in terms of, of uh, printing money. Bitcoin, of course, as we all know, is supposedly limited to 21 million bitcoins. And precisely why that number was chosen, who knows? There are some who try to work out various mathematical ideas that Satoshi may have had, but uh, inconclusive. And then, because Wittgenstein was so volatile, people introduced stable coins, and then Facebook upset the apple cart and gave everybody a terrific fright in proposing what in fact would be a global currency. Let's see what happened to that particular dream. Uh, I'd say unlikely to come about now. He spent a year looking for a regulatory authority, a regulatory license from the Swedish regulatory authorities and the more time went on, I realized that they were never going to actually grant him a license. They were going to keep thinking about it. Um, Finmar was actually advised by 20 central banks. So I think that was definitely a non-starter with Finmar. Lobbying for it in DC, where I am right now. But mm, I wouldn't place my bets on that turning out well. So then we move on to stable coins, about which I am sceptical and do not so I'll stick my neck out here and say, I don't really see stable coins lasting. <laughs> they will slowly disappear uh, because there's not really a great deal of point in a stable coin. So I'm sticking out my neck again. And then I move on to the disappearance of cash. Is it really disappearing? Don't people want cash? I can think of small uses of cash. We all carry a little bit in our purses, wallets, handbags, whatever. Um, because you might want to tip somebody $5 or something, and there it is in your available to you. So it's partly that, and there are other reasons during the pandemic, particularly which I explore for people hoarding cash. 
not something that I'd be inclined to do, but they are. A lot of people did and do. And then finally, to what I think is going to be the dominant issue now, looking forward, central bank digital currency. And that I think I'd, I'd like to field questions and discussions um, because I've put my views forward very clearly in the book, but it is still very much a matter that is under discussion. So I think um, answering questions about that would be really the best way to continue forward in the discussion. So I'm taking a somewhat sceptical view of the notion of replacing currencies. I really like the term fiat currency because it suggests that it is entirely arbitrary. My point is that a currency depends on much more be feasible. It is, of course, its value is dependent on the management of the particular economy in which that currency is placed or from which it arises. And secondly, it's the whole issue of trust. We have trust in the, uh, the leading fiat currencies. Obviously, in Venezuela, you don't know what on earth to do with your currency there. Because, of course, the way in which the economy has been managed has led to serious loss of the value of the currency both within the country and externally. So the replacement of fiat currencies with the other coins of various kinds, I think it's serious difficult. And I think that the word coin is used um, entirely uh, with a point to it because a coin suggests that there's something physical somewhere <laughs> though it might only be recorded digitally and I know that a lot of people just think oh, there is a coin somewhere and that gives them more confidence so that's why the name has been selected that's what I want us to do. yeah just um, a quick thing on the stable coin because um, you, when you're describing stable coins, you do say that they address one of the big drawbacks of Bitcoin and others, other current cryptos that have um, looked much more like speculative investments, in that they are less volatile, relatively stable, but of course they end up being largely backed by the dollar, and so the uh, you know the idea of having a rival to the dollar seems to go by the wayside. But isn't there some merit in having something that uh, is less volatile? It's less volatile, yes. But what are you using it for? Very often it's being used to transfer money from one person to another or from one country to another. And I think what we need if stable coins, and stable coins will have to be subject to really quite tough, legislation, first of all, transparency. You often buy a stable coin through an exchange. Some exchanges are actually regulated, others are not. The invitation from regulators here is in, in the US is that stable coin providers have been invited to submit their stable coins to regulation or their exchanges that they use to regulation. Many of the exchanges have, have not actually applied yet. And secondly, when it claims to be backed one to one by the dollar, oh dear, Heather is the most, as you well know, is the most important stable coin and it's most widely used. But Tether has never met to convince anyone with publicly attested accounts to show it has actually got the kind of reserves that it should have in order to back that guarantee. Uh, if you look at the pie charts, a substantial proportion has been made up with commercial loans. And I wouldn't have thought that commercial loans as your backing after the pandemic when particularly when companies are struggling in many cases to re-establish themselves is the best form of guaranteed backing. 
So yeah. that's why I think, uh, okay, uh, and uh, I would just go on to add this, which is a very important point. Why would you need stable problems to do that now? There are aspects of the fintech world which I think are, are very important and very useful. Uh, in some countries more than others, America actually tends to be a technological giant is frequently behind in the applications of technology and particularly to payment services in the US by way of contrast with the UK, for example, <clears throat> where I'll just give one example. It's not meant, of course, to be an advertisement for them, but transfer wire, transfer wise, I think it's now just called wise, is regulated. Its assets are supposed to be with a bank custodian. That's the form that the safeguarding takes. But it transfers money quickly and efficiently and cheaply. And people are using that. And I would expect more payment transfer services to arise. They need to be licensed. They need to be regulated, obviously, because you don't want your hard-earned cash <clears throat> to disappear somewhere en route. So I think that's an important area for fintech developments. And SWIFT mm. has also been pushed into the last one. Yeah. Uh, so, so Dave, would you like to come in on some of these early points about uh, the cryptocurrencies and the, the stable coin versus other? Sure. I think um, I'll well, let's circle back around to stable coins in a second, because first of all, I will drive both of you mad because I'm a horrible, I mean, I come from the technology side. So I'm a horrible nerd about these things. It drives me up the wall when you talk to, to the big, and they start talking about blockchains that aren't actually blockchains and stable coins that aren't actually stable coins and currencies that aren't actually money. So I, I have a very fit, I know I need to understand what people are talking about to, but um, but just to, so we'll come back to stable coins in a second. We we'll just start with Bitcoin. Um, I did read uh, Una's book uh, over the weekend, and um, and obviously the uh, I'm reasonably tolerably well versed in the in the history of Bitcoin and its origin. In fact, I went to the very first Bitcoin conference in Europe actually, which was which was a decade ago. Um, I've started to sort of think of it more as a sort of protest movement, really, or as a sort of religious thing rather than a sort of economic uh financial thing it, i think it's a bit it, it's founded in a in protest against the against the great financial crisis and and i think you know a great many people would be broadly sympathetic to the idea of um locking up the bankers who, who got away scot free with with all of this so i can sort of see why it got this traction i rather like its mysterious because obviously, in order to become a sort of religion or a cult, you have to have this mysterious founder that nobody knows. And you, you know what I mean? It's like everybody knows who started Mondex. It was Tim Jones. You can't turn that into a cult. I've tried. It doesn't. Um, but uh, so I quite. And, and so I think it has a very weird locus um, in the world, which I think sometimes can sort of distract from the big picture stuff. But nonetheless, it's been valuable i think it's testament to what i think economists call the sailing ship effect which was which was i don't know if you remember this but it was rooted in the arrival of the cutty sark you know so when when eventually steamships came along um this gave one last kick to the, to the makers of the sailing ships and so they came up with the cutty sark and so on and it was far, but in the end it was doomed and i i sort of i wonder if bitcoin is a you know bitcoin has given a kick to uh to 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 the financial infrastructure um which in time um means new technologies will replace it but in you know it has one last and maybe cbdc is that sort of one last uh sort of response but to the point about stable coins Una, i'm curious uh, so first of all they all use the word stable coin completely incorrectly because the original or the point about stable coins was when you had things like bitcoin which were um, algorithmically controlled rather than controlled by some external regulation or third parties, 
coming up with clever algorithms that would try to match supply and demand to keep the value of the coin. That's what a stable coin was. That's what it actually meant. It, it, it's come to meant, it's come to mean these kind of digital assets, which are linked to things outside the world of crypto, the off ledger assets, a bit like Hoover has become a word, you know, when you don't, when you mean a vacuum cleaner. So, so first of all, there are three distinct categories in my head. There are stable coins, which are algorithmically maintained by balancing supply and demand. There are digital assets, which are backed by fiat currencies, which in the old days we used to call currency boards. So you might call that a digital currency board. Like and then, awesome. Yes. And, and then, there are, then there are digital assets, which are backed by some other thing, like some basket uh, or gold or you know, square inches, the Mona Lisa or something. So in my head, these are three quite different categories. And when we're talking about CBDCs, we what we central really... Bank, central bank digital currencies. Just sorry, central bank digital currencies. Absolutely digital. clear. For yeah. Yeah. Um, what we're really talking about is effectively a sort of digital currency board with a 100% reserve in some other fiat currency. So the question then becomes, what's the point? Because, you know, under, under current... European electronic money regulation, for example, you can issue electronic money. In fact, you can't issue electronic money unless it has a 100% reserve at the moment. So we can already do that. So what's the what's the special source? What's the what's the point of stable coins, I guess is my question here. I mean, I, I have an answer, but I'm curious about Una's more informed perspective. Yeah, because I think Una, you wouldn't approve of um the point that many people might see in these, because you know, anonymity, secrecy, can aid crime, um, and lack of regulation can also lead to investors being duped, scammed. I mean, look at this flocky advert thing on the uh, London Underground at the moment, for example. So, um, do you have any sympathy with them? Um, some of the reasons why people might want to have, um, you know, a, a means of exchange that's, uh, you know, not to do with central banks and governments. Uh, well, first of all, I, I do distinguish, Dave, between in the book between the three kinds of stable coins, just as you have done. But the focus is on the ones uh, that are linked to a, a currency, a fiat. The, the third, the third category, yeah, yeah. Because I think they are the ones that are most used and the focus of interest has been. So that's very important from that point of view. Um, Bitcoin has, as we know, really turned out to be much more of an investment than being used as a currency, except for those who do wish to hide their transactions. It's very much easier to do that with a Bitcoin than it is, I think, to do with a stable coin because it's stable coin. You will, you can even buy them through your bank account. <laughs> you can buy them through an exchange um, if you are sensible. Although, of course, most people will not know this. You should buy them through a regulated exchange because then your stable coin will not disappear. Um, Privacy, yes, I do. I do appreciate privacy. And in fact, that's one of the reasons why I'm concerned about the notion of a central bank digital currency. Um, I take your point about e-money uh, being easily issued. And so why? My point is, what? why would you want to change your dollars into Tether or some such thing? Most people don't know the risks involved. And so that's why consumer protection is, seems to me extremely important. <laughs> and it's extremely important that they, that they understand that they're then leaving um, the consumer protection through an investor's compensation scheme or through the FDIC here in America and similar schemes elsewhere. They're leaving that because <coughs> of the relationship, I think the relationship to the dollar works, but they are not actually counted. Stablecoin producers or suppliers are not actually counted as banks and are not subject to the same 
compensation laws. So it's those sort of issues that I think are extremely important. And that's why I look at regulation. Um, Jane, you raised the important the, the issue of, of untraceable transfers. Um, and that being the point particularly of Bitcoin, we note that when uh, once a, rans- uh, a company is subject to a ransomware attack, what do the attackers wish to be paid in the Bitcoins? <laughs> that is perfectly understandable from their point of view. I think I- some are completely upside. Any, any transparency, any form of regulation, I think we have to protect consumers who do say we don't, you know, we don't really understand Bitcoin, but it's exciting and new and it's fashionable, and we can't possibly be seen to be old-fashioned. Dave, I think you're itching there's to get in on some of this. There's, there's definitely an element of that. Now, I want to... I, I, um, Una's chapter on the, the, I think she called it the decline of cash. I can't see my notes at this instant, but you had a section on on getting rid of cash, which I want to come back to. But I just, I, I'm just want to sort of drive down a bit on the on the that the that digital currency board branch of the stable coin table because I I think, I mean, we talk about CBD in a slightly undifferentiated way, but as as I'm sure, and in fact, you touch on this. The distinction between wholesale and retail, I think, is actually rather interesting because the demand for, and actually, by the way, one of the, I'm writing something else about it at the moment for um, for something else I'm involved in at the moment. And one of the things that really interested me is the German bank's response to the ECB digital euro consultation, which I've given German banks are historically rather conservative. Um, I, I thought their response to it was really very interesting because what they said was, well, look, a retail CBDC would be nice, but as Una said in her book, and I'll paraphrase technologically, there's no burning platform. You know, I mean, people have debit cards and things, and they work tolerably well. You know, it's, it's not the sky isn't going to collapse if we don't have it tomorrow. So therefore, um, we can we can wait and have a retail CBDC that's actually useful and this relates to your points about innovation in the future and competition so and i sort of agree with that it will be nice to have something that was a platform for innovation a new way of doing things and there are some technical reasons why i'd like to do that as well to do with resilience and to have something that was in parallel with the existing infrastructure which does periodically fail and also i noticed that in places like china a rather important aspect of the retail CBDC is the ability to work in the absence of the mobile network and power, you know, when there's a flood or a disaster or, 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 or you know, management incompetence that brings down the payment card network for the afternoon, this sort of thing. So, so I agree with that. So that's, but we don't need it tomorrow and we've got time to think it through. And that particular issue around privacy is going to take some thinking through. Um, that's for sure. I had the, I had the interesting experience of, of giving evidence to the House of Lords Economic Affairs Committee a couple of weeks ago about this privacy issue. And it is genuinely complicated. And anybody that comes in with the black and white solutions, you know they're wrong because it's difficult. The second point is about the wholesale digital currency, and that's to do with reducing the costs of financial intermediation. And actually, I, I can rather see that because the idea of doing delivery versus payment without clearing and settlement is pretty attractive. And the fact that the institutions are already investing in the equivalent of a a wholesale CBDC. And and, and actually, I just read something from George Selgin, the economist, talking about this with Katie. He was saying, you know, if we have this sort of narrow banking conception of a CBDC, so in other words, you have a private institution which issues these CBDC tokens, but they have a 100% reserve in central bank money. That's that's the same thing as having a central bank digital currency. And actually, for the wholesale markets, that's what they want. They want this because they want to be able to play around with it on their new blockchain and shared ledger and all this sort of thing, which they can't do with account-based money. So I can agree with all that. I thought there was Would surprising... That, does that speed up trade? That, does that have some advantages for trade? Yes, well, because they, they what they want to do is have more complex 
instruments that can be traded automatically around this sort of thing to to, to and, and I'm sympathetic to that. I mean, I, I can see why that would make sense. But I want to test um, their other conclusion, which I thought was very fascinating, was they said, well, we also need industrial um, digital currency. We need money for machines so that the supply chain, they call it smart um, industry 4.0, you know, smart supply chain, IoT. They want to get rid of letters of credit and, you know, they want to get rid of, yeah. And I thought that was also interesting, Una, that um, that maybe there's more kinds of central bank digital currency than we at first think, because Bitcoin gets us to think about these particular cases. But actually, maybe there's a wider world out there where central bank money could be useful. Uh, several things about this. Um, first of all, a very interesting uh, project, pilot project in Hong Kong, which I had the pleasure of talking to them about in the fall of 2018. I was on the way back from lecturing in China, so <laughs> stopped off at Hong Kong and because I wanted to discuss this with them. But a very interesting one is it's, uh, in Hong Kong, they had several um, uh, several banks which provided trade trade finance. The problem that they had faced was that small businesses in particular applied for trade finance from all the banks without telling without telling any of the banks that this was so. <laughs> so through a blockchain, uh, which they agreed to join, the banks agreed to join, they could tell if Company A had actually applied for trade finance to all the banks concerned and put a stop to that. And in a way, that assisted with uh, letters of credit and I think one of the major shipping lines uses blockchain for that purpose. I'm not sure why you need a currency to do that. But anyway, to go back to the wholesale, yes, very interesting pilot projects have taken place. The note in Canada, which after its pilot project on the wholesale market, was really quite interesting that it was all operating without regulation. They needed the regulation to be updated in order to, to deal with that. So I, under, I understand the need for speed and rapid settlement. Yep, that's fair enough. But I think how it is done is not just a question of technology, but it is a question of transparency and so on, and regulation to ensure that takes place. I have, I have to say one more thing that seems to me to affect um, the whole push towards digital currencies, and that is an obsession with speed. Cost, of course, I understand, but an obsession with speed. And I said, no, do you really need it to go that quickly? <laughs> and why? And is, are you going to put speed above all other considerations. Speed is important, obviously. Costs are important. Um, and that is, of course, where um, Zuckerberg and other stablecoin providers <coughs> with substitutes for fiat currency claim that they can do it more cheaply and more speedily. But that's, as I've said before, frankly, that is where I, an important direction for financial innovation, and particularly in America. So just get your act together and get these payment licenses off the ground. Well, the American, I mean, I agree with you. There is something odd about the American, but but I think there's um there's a deep seated thing. I mean, the thing is, if if you think that the Federal Reserve is you know a Zionist conspiracy and is out to enslave the workers and and all this kind of thing. Then it doesn't matter whether it's a digital dollar; you're still not going to use it because you want to use digital gold or you know whatever it is. I mean, we can't do anything about that. But the, the one thing that is slightly odd about it, and this was certainly true in the D in the Libra white paper, which was the original. Um, I can't remember the exact wording, but it said something along the lines of "Imagine you know you can get on a bus just using your phone." And you can buy vegetables in a market without cash, and you can send money to your friend who doesn't have a credit card. 
unaware that everybody, everywhere else in the world, you can do this. I mean, America is the only place where you can't do this. Uh, in Kinshasa, you can pay for vegetables in the market using your mobile phone or whatever. So, so I agree there is something odd about that. But the, the speed point, I think, certainly when you look at those industrial uses and on the wholesale uses where they, they want to program these more complex uh, ways of managing risk, I, I can sort of see that. And to answer the question, well, why, why don't you just use it, use, do it using settlement accounts um, at, at the Bank of England? Well, of course, the reason is because you can't access those from the blockchain. I and mean, what they want to do, they, they need central bank money that they can put onto the ledgers um, to, do, to do the. And so I understand why they want to do that. Retail, it's, retail, it's not clear to me at all that, that that's how you would do it at the retail level. Um, but that, I think that's a different question. Yeah. One of the interesting sections in Nuna's book is, um, which in, in a way might give fodder to those, the sort of decentralized finance advocates, is that she, you know, she talks about, well, you know, think about China and its um, quite advanced efforts uh, in terms of um, an official digital currency. Um, but of course, that just becomes part of the um, rather sinister state surveillance uh, next network. Yeah. And, you know, she says, well, you know, do you really want either your country's central bank or its government to know everything about your transactions and accounts, um, you know, as part of its um, building up its picture of, you know, knowing everything about you. But it, um, so that's um, one of the buts that Una has about uh, central bank digital currencies and in particular the account based ones. Um, but doesn't that give some sort of um, sucker to the sort of Zuckerberg, you know, well, if you if you don't trust that universe, how about this other universe, which isn't based on sort of a national uh, jurisdiction? Well, I, I, I remember this being discussed at a CSFO round table, actually. Uh, I think it was when you, uh, this idea when basically, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, this is the wrong choice. If you're saying to people, look, do you want your transactions monitored by an unelected dictator who's surrounded by yes men and who is there in perpetuity whose decisions are absolute or the central committee of the chinese communist party i mean that's not the sort of choices we want to be making we want to make a choice which says we want privacy in our financial transactions but not anonymity and the difference between privacy and anonymity is to my mind substantial should it be possible for me to move unlimited amounts of money around anonymously or well, clearly not that's that's a disaster we don't we don't live in a world of of warlords we live in a society we live in a democracy with with institutions so should i be free to do whatever i like no i shouldn't um the the, the opposite of that isn't should the local council be able to spy on me every transaction um to see if i've bought too much lawn fertilizer or something which is which is what these things end up getting used for isn't it i mean it, you put it in there to 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 fight off waves of terrorists breaching our state defences and storming ashore, and they end up using it to annoy people who won't cut their tree or have got the bus shelter in the wrong place or something. So I, I think it's false to put those up as the only two options. And it could well be, and I I just put this up as a hypothesis to be examined by Una. It could well be that a, a sort of European perspective on this. In fact, I might add also a Canadian and Australian New Zealand perspective on all this might be to come up with a more sort of privacy enhanced version of the infrastructure that, that stands in opposition to, 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 to both the sort of Chinese and American visions. We, we could see those as equally undesirable ends of a spectrum from our cultural perspective. Perhaps the European contribution to the debate will be to make you know, uh, a, a more a more private, but nonetheless, you know, regulated and, and law abiding currency. Yeah. Uh, first, Luna, what's, what do you think of that? Well, actually, I think the European approach to regulating um, all aspects of cryptocurrencies, stable coins, at least produce something comprehensive and thought through. Whereas, I, it's not not true here in America. I think the UK is kind of rather more hesitant. Uh, let me say, first of all, why did I refer to China? Because I got really tired of so many people looking to China. Well, China's getting ahead on digital, central bank digital currency. We must rush to catch up. 
So I want to say, uh, just a minute, in your rush to catch up, then you'd better think about these particular issues. We referred to Selgin. I know, I know him and I know his views. He, of course, would favour narrow banking. He thinks that the central bank is too prone to print far too much money and must keep him awake at night right now with the current budget proposals. <laughs> and let me just give you a little, a little story here, which I think we've managed to stop. Um, the Biden administration proposed that the IRS should receive from every single every single bank account, 140 million plus of those, um, the total transactions of that bank account. He lowered that to $600, which everybody realized was ridiculous. I wrote a piece for the Hill here, and the, the favored threshold was $10,000. So I looked at the federal poverty line for single people, which is $12,880 looked at a breakdown of their expenditure, 80% on unavoidable things like rent and so on, uh, and that put them above the $10,000 anyway. Now, once you started the IRS receiving all of those, the temptation is to move on to say, well, what actually were those transactions? Similarly, that is a serious risk with the central bank. If there are ways of retaining privacy through proper encryption, which I think you can do, as opposed to anonymity, I didn't go into that in my book. It was a bit too complicated, I thought, to tag on at the end. But the other issue with other with the central bank digital currency, and in my view, the more important one, is undermining commercial banks. If you put all the provision of currency in the hands of the central bank, then who is going to lend whom? Now, I know it is supposedly regulated, although if you go back to my Fanny and Freddie book, or see how a politician seriously screwed that one up, hence the nightmare, which we all have suffered from in the end. But I think that that could lead to a huge bureaucracy, and then to whom would they lend and how much? Certainly to no one innovating, no one with an unusual request for a mortgage that wouldn't be fitted into two or three nice, neat algorithms. Um, I, and a bunch of bureaucrats running the show. No, definitely not. Mm. Um, doing, producing a central bank digital currency, making it account-based, and even the BIS talks about, well, who should actually have access at the retail level to a central bank account? So all sorts of issues there. Yes. I wanted to flag and are very serious issues. And, and you know, just another little thing um, which I find is noticeable in the UK, they're fond of using the expression nudging. It, sorry, the expression? Nudging. Yeah, the cast yes. nuns yes. Yeah. Nudge people in what they think of the, as the right direction. Well, excuse me, I do not wish to be nudged into anything by a civil servant who thinks that they know how to run my life better than me. Mm. And also, um, if they wish to say that it's undesirable, has a bad effect on the economy, right, explain it to me, spell it out, justify it. But I do not wish to be nudged. <laughs> Yeah, so, so so that's the problem with the account base, and and the, you know the, the idea that central banks would take deposits and, as you say, get involved in lending. You know, what are they going to do with them? Are they going to get involved in lending decisions? One feels a little bit like that. But but Dave, um, cash isn't like that. Um, I don't think tokens would be, which would if they were really made as cash like as possible. So so that there's another way to go, isn't there? Well, I saw a I saw a survey from the Centre for Macroeconomics, sort of mid year. Which said something like that. You know, most most economists thought that the impact on commercial banks would be quite limited because 
the Bank of England, as I'm sure other central banks, um, you know, have no intention of offering accounts directly to the to the public. And in fact, what they would do is they would, in fact, the Bank of England have already created these kind of omnibus accounts to allow regulated institutions to hold on behalf of customers. What would actually happen is, you know, you go to Barclays and you you draw out some central bank digital currency to store in your phone or whatever you're doing with it. Then you would never go near the Bank of England. It's somebody else's problem in this instance, Barclays. Uh, to maintain those accounts. So, I'd, and the, and the thing is, so one of the fears would be, well, what what if everybody took their money out of the bank in some sort of bank run, and held it in their digital currency wallet instead of in the bank, um, which I, I imagine is a is a realistic fear. But then, um, but if you look at the places where real interest rates are negative, I germ. I mean, I saw a very detailed study of the um, situation in Germany. Um, and I, I can't remember what the number was, but even at sort of minus 1.75%, people weren't taking their money out and storing it in cash because cash is an absolutely gigantic pain to, to manage, unless you're a drug dealer. If you're a drug dealer, cash is fantastically convenient and, and helpful, but for normal people, it isn't. So is it possible that if we went to digital currency, people would draw it out because it's less of a hassle to do so? I think that's a that's a realistic possibility. Um, would they draw it out in unlimited amounts and lose faith in the banking system completely? Well, if they did that, we'd have a lot more to worry about, really, than whether Waitrose took central bank digital currency or not. So I'm not quite sure where that leaves me, but I don't know enough about banking to answer that. And, and in any case, the ECB and all the others are putting maximum limits on the wallets, which they can't do without a digital identity infrastructure that we don't have either. So uh, all of which points to the fact we're not going to be having digital currency tomorrow. Well, retail digital currency. Yeah. So, so the digital wallet, um, yeah. your transactions might be um, less transparent, but the digital wallet itself would have an ID, an ID that could be traced. Well, I mean, to Una's point about cryptography, I think the technology to do this actually is is pretty well established. It's not 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 really that complicated. So, you know, as far as the Bank of England anti money laundering supercomputer robot is concerned person A is sending money to person B, um, if person A is sending a million pounds to person B every day of the week, um, it might trip some red light somewhere, which causes some actual law enforcement to take place. If the plod call up Barclays and say, well, who is person A? Barclays will tell them that it's me. I mean, there's no, you, you, you know what I mean? It's a, But the thing is, you have to do that through proper legal means. And if if the police go and get a warrant because there's some reason to ex- imagine that I'm up to something, well, then, of course, the bank should tell them it's me. Mm. You know, should should the council be able to just snoop around in the pool of transactions? Well, no, they shouldn't. So I, I think that's but but as I say, I think that's complicated because that's an example of an area where and I'm sure Una would agree with this. It shouldn't be people like me that are setting the dial on how this should work. It should be society broadly speaking which is setting that dial and then telling the technologists to implement it accordingly you know allowing the technologists to build something which is either completely anonymous or not anonymous at all that's not the right way to do it we we should be we should be setting the dial and telling them to build it that way yeah so um we're coming to the end of our discussion so una um the subtitle money trust and regulation well i think um perhaps you just say that it's is it is it money or not as we know it, Jim? Um, regulation, I think we can all agree that it, it, that's not just coming, but it's in train and it's, you know, we're going to get more of it. Um, trust, uh, perhaps, is the most difficult one. Um, you know, can you see, um, is, is there going to be a currency that's not backed by governments, central banks, um, that will be as trusted um, as they are? So, you know. I, I think that's a good question. Do I think that some people will be foolish enough to trust it? Uh, yes, that is entirely possible. People do the most extraordinary things with their money and investments. <laughs> you, you almost collapse in astonishment as to why they do. But people, but, but people do that now, and, and I'll wager all three of us on this call right now already do that since almost none of my wealth such as it is, is actually in the form of money. 
In fact, my my bank account, in fact, my overdraft is in the form of money. Um, but all of my wealth is in the form of pension funds and stocks and shares and houses, my house and all, all my car and all sorts of things like that. I mean, none of my wealth is in money as it is now. So I've already made those decisions. I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, I, I Ken Dodd chose an alternative path and and put it all in 50 quid notes in his loft. Uh, most people don't do that. Most people have already made that choice. Yes, some people do, but that's not really the point. Um, the point at issue is it might be in a pension fund now, but at some point in the future, you will be turning that into money and you'll want to be able to buy things with that money, <coughs> even though it's your debit card or your credit card or whatever. <coughs> so you will be turning. No, trust, I think, is essential. And I think the question, so particularly with Bitcoin and its misuse of the word honesty and the way in which <coughs> excuse me bitcoin in particular is contrary to satoshi's expectations is open to a 51 percent attack because of the way in which concentrations of both the holders of bitcoins but more importantly the miners of bitcoins have uh, up to a very recent past because Miners have been expelled from China. Too much competition for China's forthcoming central bank digital currency. But no, I think we we don't sort of positively express that we trust the dollar or the pound. But we do in all that we do with it and all of our actions. You give me this coloured piece of paper. And I'm very happy with that and can go off and spend it at another shop and mm. particular goods for it. So the trust is implicit in the whole system. Of course, I'm not saying that a central bank or those running a particular country can destroy that trust. Of course they can. And it has been done too often in the past. But for most of us, we trust that what we've got is what we thought we had and we can buy whatever we think we can buy with it. And it's that that is the form that trust takes. Yeah. So um, we, we need to, to, to wind it up there. I should I should say that I, I would recommend the book. I mean, it is, I did, when I was reading it, feel it's, um, at least for a novice like me, uh, perhaps not for Dave, um, all you need to know about cryptocurrencies, but were afraid to ask. At least it sets you asking the right questions. I mean, it will drive the sort of... Um, libertarians, um, you know, freedom of the internet, um, you know, anti-establishment people mad. I expect it's not for them, but it's, I think it's, there's a, you know, huge amount in it for, for, for normal people who just need to be better informed. Um, so I just thank, thank you, Una, good luck with the book. Thanks very much, Dave, uh, for, for joining us. Pleasure and, to be here, Una. Yeah. And um, thank you very much to everybody for, for watching, stroke, listening. <laughs>